of what I was going to say, because I did go down and and George and this other Irishman, John David McCann, uh, they took it upon themselves to teach me all the evil that they knew. <laughs> and of course, I was, I was an innocent. No, I really was. I was as pure as a human flush, as they say. <laughs> but anyway, we had a very good time, and, uh, and we have been good friends ever since. Good friends ever since. Thank you very much for, for, for a asking me to, to speak here tonight. Um, it's, uh, it's, I come from an Irish area, which I will be talking a little bit about. Uh, and I come from, in part, an Irish background, uh, with uh, Riley's and Walsh's in my background. And my grandfather, even though his last name was McKay, he could never escape the Irish accent. He, he always called the car a car, and, because he grew up in Lot 7, and you had to speak with the Irish accent if you were there. And, and, so, and his, mother, his mother was a Riley, so I guess that's where he got it. Anyway, uh, I feel that I should probably be singing here tonight, but George asked me uh, earlier on if I would take part in the lecture series. And so I said I, I, I would gladly do this. Uh, for George, uh, but I am, I am going to sing at least one song, and it's a long one, and I'll have to wait, you'll have to wait till the end. I want to talk to you about, I want to talk to you about uh, uh, a notable Irishman, uh, a man who is a non-sung hero in Prince Edward Island, uh, a pioneer school teacher, uh, a, a, a man who slaved uh, in, the, in the pioneer settlements uh, in the 1830s and 40s and 50s and 60s, uh, teaching school. Uh, he called himself a cultivator of brains. And uh, that would have been enough to earn him a place. But he was also a poet. And he was an incredible Irish nationalist but when he came to PEI, he adopted the island, and it became, to him, uh, tied for first place with the best place in the world, which was Ireland. Uh, I think I, I'll, I'll show you his, his picture first. Uh, this is, this is, uh, uh, this is not a very good picture. It's upside down right now. There we go. And that's him, and he's so big. I, I, uh, you can just barely see him. And he died in 1878, uh, as he had lived, a poor man. Uh, and he would be so happy, he knew we were talking about him tonight. He would be so pleased. Uh, and so I am going to talk about it. And, I, and I, it's going to take me 50 to 20 minutes just to sing the song we wrote. So I have to go through this other stuff first. I've got a pile of stuff here, and I don't want to bore you too bad. James uh, H. Fitzgerald was born in Cork, Ireland, actually at Cork Harbor, uh, and he came here, uh, that was in, in 1797, 1797, and he came here when he was about 30 years old, it was about 1827 when he came, and I, <clears throat> I always, I always think of him, because when I was a, a, a child, there was an the quintessential Irish bachelor. He was an old, old man at that point. His name was Frank O'Holloran, and he was the man who could quote poetry. And he, I learned the Larry Borman song from him. And Frank would, there was a poem he recited for me one time, and some of you know it, and some of you may have actually have heard these things. It was called the Shandon Bells. And I'm assuming it's Shandon Cathedral in Cork, Ireland. Did you ever hear that poem, George? Have you run across it? And it's a beautiful poem, and I was, he was nine, he and I was nine when he recited it. I'm exaggerating a bit here, but Frank was an old man at that point, and, and it's a beautiful poem, and I think of James H. Fitzgerald growing up in Cork, and, and it goes, with, with deep affection and recollection, I often think of those Shandon Bells, who sound so wild would in days of childhood ring round my cradle their magic spells. On this I ponder, where'er I wander, 
and yet grow fonder, sweet cork of thee, with thy bells of Shandon that sound so grand on the pleasant waters of the River Lee. And I remember Frank Holland is writing that, and that's a while ago, folks. Uh, and he he didn't have it written down. He was it was coming out of his head too. Anyway, Lady Big Fitzgerald came to the island in 1827, and he taught school. He, he, he was a school teacher then. He had been educated in Ireland, and he taught school. He taught school in the Bedette area, and throughout the, and I think he may have gotten married here in the 1830s. I know that he had four sons and four daughters. And in 1839, he was just prior to this, he was teaching over toward in Seven Mile Bay, near, you know, the, the Bedeck area there. And for some reason, the families there, uh, there were Irish families who were making sort of a, a, a temporary stop there. And because some of them did that before they came to Lot 7, which is where I'm from. And I'm going to show you a map of Lot 7 in a minute. But anyways, he, he knew those people. They were his friends. And they went to Lot 7, and a few years later, in 1839, they asked him if he would come up and start a school. And he did. He started a school, I will show you, because this is a, this is a, uh, uh, that's just, that's going to be hard for you to see. But that's the, the coast of, uh, of Lot 7. And don't think this one is like Glen Gary, because it's a Scots name, but it's all Irish. Uh, and one of the things he did was he, 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 he named the place Mount Pleasant because every place he went, he insisted on naming the place. And he was such a forceful character that people just sort of gave up and said, okay. Uh, he lived, I'm just trying to see now, um, first of all, the, the, this settlement when he went there was called, he started right here, where my, where is this is now? My mind. Uh, after working with these for years, I'm, I'm stymied. Um, yeah, okay, just a sec. There we are. There is, uh, I thought it was this side. Everything's backwards here. Um, I'm going to have to look to teach what I have to do. Um, oh, yes. Um, <laughs> there we go, right here. These are the scouts. the three sisters and that's what it's called he called it the landing because there was a little gold there anyways he taught school in lot seven for five years five or six years and he started to raise a family there and among other people he taught this man ended up teaching some sort of notables and i always think it was his influence he taught as a child the first irish priest to be born on that block his name was father patrick Doyle. And his relatives still live there on the lot. My um, brother is married to one of them. And Father Patrick Doyle shows a book written about him. He's a remarkable, remarkable man. Uh, he spent his last years in Summerside. He was the priest in Summerside in, during the broke years in Summerside, in 1870. But he, he's down east of Charlottetown. He's east of Charlottetown. And they, everybody, and this, at a time when this didn't happen, everybody thought the world, including the 
I say this because it's the truth, because the newspapers were printing this. And Father God always was prepared to go to God's business. And they thought this was great. And he was such a diplomat. And they tell the story, some of you may have heard this story about him, if you know about him. The story of the time he was in East of and he is in the parish down there, and I don't know which one it was, but anyway, it doesn't make any difference. <coughs> The Protestants were the Protestant community was building a church, a Protestant church in the area. That was fine. And because Father Doyle was such a nice man, they thought they would go to, to the, the parish house and go collecting. Well, he was caught, I and mean, this was a terrible situation to be in, because he couldn't he couldn't be seen, you know, donating money to the new Protestant church. He would he didn't know what to do. And he thought about it for a long while. He thought about it for a long while. And finally he said, uh, then he said, I'm sorry. He said, I, I can't make a donation for the building up of the new church, but here's $10. You can use it to tear down the old <laughs> <laughs> So they go. So they go. So he got out of the sack free. They never let him go about it. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> he was really quite a character. Well, that was, that was Father Doyle. Uh, anyway, uh, James Harrington was Todd. Todd. He was the son of Thomas Doyle. And by 1845, he was recognized as a great teacher. Uh, and, and, and the school visitor, an old Scotsman named Neil, visited the school. And uh, this is what he had to say. And I don't think that he had used the term Camel. I mean, it's my, uh, it's Lot 7. Uh, Camel was not used. It was, they called it Lot 7 or Apollos at that point. 50 scholars that would be in one room stayed at the school satisfactory. Stayed at the school satisfactory. Stayed at the school house. Very unsatisfactory, okay? And he was doing a good job, and they knew. This school, he wrote, has for several years proved of much benefit to the inhabitants of this remote settlement, who are laudably ambitious to provide for their children all the education they need to allow. This is an Irish settlement, and they were determined to allow these kids to do. They were determined. It is hoped that the projected improvement in the road communication of this quarter will bring the settlers within reach of many of the advantages from which they have long been cut. There were no roads. And, and Fitzgerald complained years later that he, the way you walk was along the gates. And if you took a false step, you would be dashed to pieces. But he always made them a little bit worse than they were. But, anyways, and he said, I remember when the site of Camel was here, that road, that it was thicket of the forest and the haunt of the wild beasts. Anyways, the school is under the charge of one of the most experienced teachers in the colony and whose remuneration is not equal to the length nor the utility of his services in the cause of instruction. There's a non-licensed school in the vicinity which is not yet in business. That is a school just run by a merchant for his own children. Well, okay. Uh, that was lot seven. And that was 18... 39 to 1845. And he, for some reason, left. Now, he probably left in Holland. You will see that this man was not an easy man to deal with. I'm not going to try to deal with him because he was full of passion and terribly strong and uh, of terribly strong opinions. Uh, and a good man, a, a, a good man, but very, very passionate. Uh, anyways, he went to Lot 14, and I'll just show you that. Lot 14, it, it's on the Main Western Road where he settled. It's at Richmond, and so if you're driving up the Main Western Road, you go through there. First thing he did, I guess, or somebody else did, was name it, uh, when the railroad went through, they named it Fitzgerald Station. Uh, and his farm was, I'll get mixed up here again if I don't look at my map. Um, his farm was uh, right there. 
That's James H. Fitzgerald. Uh, this map was made, and folks, I know this is hard to see. Uh, it's, uh, the map is too small. But it's on, and you know the house that he built? Tell me the house he built. There is a house there that he built. It's the Hill of the Bar. And uh, it's um, on the right hand side as you're going, as you're going west. And he lived there the rest of his life. <coughs> but when this map was made, he had been dead for two years. Uh, he gives probably the, the clearest account of teaching suicide. I, uh, the, 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 the terrible trouble and the terrible uh, hardships that he underwent teaching school, sleeping in the schoolhouse, freezing, no wood. At one point, he noticed, and by the way, his, his journal, his diary, which he kept for years, is, is in the archives of my phone. You can, you can read it. It's it hard going, it's hard to read. But sleeping in the schoolhouse. Uh, and of course, uh, they wouldn't supply it with wood. At one point, on a really, really cold night, he ran out of wood and had to cut up one of the seats in order to survive in the morning. And not only that, but he, uh, in order to, to teach his own children, he would take them with him. A little boy, the young one, the youngest of them, he called him the little sir. Uh, his name was John Morris, John Morris Fitzgerald. Morris is an interesting name because there were a lot of Morrises in the Irish families up in the uh, west. And I wonder if you can name the sort of fellow after, after a friend in La Fenna. A lot of Morrises up there, a lot of the Morris Collins and the, several of them. Anyway, he was taking this little boy, taking this little boy to school, and they were, they were staying in the school house. Uh, and there's there, it says here, uh, Sunday, 11th of November, 1855. James came with me, that was another son, from home, brought two loaves of bread. John Morris came to stop with me in the school of meaning he was saying, but that's what, how he always put it that way. This is a poet. He wrote poetry all the time. He was not recognized. That's the basis of my talk, which I'm dragging on, so I have to get through it. Um, I wrote two pieces of poetry last week, one for Grant's Potato Pickers and the other for Mrs. Robinson's place. I call it Robinson Hall. Uh, and right, uh, five, he talks about the war in Europe and so on. Stopped in school, boarding myself and John Morris there. So, anyways, oh, this is uh, <laughs> uh, another sort of recounting of what he was, he said, uh, Shane, a little boy, boarded his 12 days back at Island McLean's, boarded poorly and bed worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he had a terrible, he had a terrible time, because his parents, in spite of the fact that they wanted to give him an some of them didn't want to pay a price, say, and they resented the, he, he, he boarded his parents. You know, this was 10 or 15 miles, 10 miles more. Compose a song for a few girls picking potatoes at Mr. Grant's. My legs feel sore going home today. That, now he would be close to 60 at this point. Uh, Mrs. Grant very kind to me and in good terms with all. And then he, he was always writing what was happening in the news of the day and he never took a, he never lost a chance to take a crack at the English. He says here, supposedly friendly work going on. Sebastopol, taken by the United Army of French and English. The French behaved gallant, and the English were beat. Some to bring up that fact, but anyway, uh, that was. Uh, <laughs> and he, um, you know, this, hmm, he. How can I put it gently? I don't think there's any way to put it gently. He roused everybody. He roused the priests. He roused the trustees. He roused with the people he boarded with. And he was a difficult man uh, because he was of very decided opinions. And now here is here's an example of a row with one of the trustees. He said, uh, John Ramsey took his son from school. 
and advance a pair of false carriages against him. Feel happy that some is taken away for he was with Cory for fool. He didn't pull any punches at all. Uh, yeah, that was that. That's again, 1850, yeah, 1855. Um, Oh, where is this one that I was looking for? Oh, here it is. He, he was teaching at this point in, in Crape River. Now, Crape River was where the great, uh, the famous Larry Warren grew up, the great song, okay? And uh, Larry was a child at this point. He would be, he would be about seven or eight years old, and Fitzgerald boarded at their place. Here was a man who was writing poetry all the time. It was part of a tradition, a, a, a poetic tradition. And I'm convinced that that's what Larry Gorman wrote, owed in part, he owed in part to James H. Fitzgerald, who, who was known for being a poet. And, uh, but anyways, he stayed at Borman's place. He stayed at, Lar uh, at Larry's father. He boarded there when Larry was a child and taught school in the community and would have taught Larry. And here's what he had to say about Thomas Gorman. Now, Thomas Gorman uh, was an Irish immigrant and who uh, was, uh, uh, there we go. Mm. Um, he stayed at Gorman's and he was proud. He was Thomas. He said, um, he mentioned going there, and then he said, left off boarding at Thomas Gorman's after five days, owing to his snorting disposition. <laughs> so he was, and Gorman was a friend of his. So, uh, um, anyway, um, he, uh, I, I'm now, here's another one where he goes into the old store. The old being the richest man on the island at this point. He goes into the old store and rowed with them over the price of ginger, I think it was. Left home on Monday the 27th, was in seeing out the dog who was very ill. Had a few words of jokes, this is how he put it. They wanted to charge four shillings a pound for ginger, hope it on the counter after buying it. <laughs> just, a, just a very interesting personality. Now, I have to get to what I was going to say. Uh, well, the, the fact, oh, here is, here is something. I wish somebody could tell me about this. He talks about going into what they call frogs. <laughs> the, the, the now, he was an old man at this point. He would be almost, as I say, almost 60. And they had, they had a frolic. He did really, really put out if they didn't invite him to these things. But he had gone to a frolic, anyways. And he loved to have a drink. I'll tell you that. He mentions it quite often. Uh, but anyways, he. This will give you some picture of the life of the Irish emigrants. And he, he talks to the Lord. He talks to the Lord. He has such a great guy. He said, "Dance." Kitty's rambles to the dog uh, at the frolic of William Brown. Now, what do they folks? Uh, if there anybody, if there's anyone in here who knows what Irish folk dance that would have been done 150 years ago, that's the, 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 the reel or the tune or the dance that he did. Kitty's rambles to the dog, which is the southern island. Uh, then he just adds some ruffians hold stones at the schoolhouse. This is what he was treating this. This is what he put up with on the weekly days. The young fellows of the community who should have been home but work without plaguing me. Uh, his, his reputation, even though it had been 150 years since he left my community in the new community before me, his reputation there was that they had tortured him, you know, and he was having to put up with it. Uh, so it was not a, a pleasant situation. I'm trying to make a case for him as a poet. Uh, and the, the, it's a very, very sad thing that he, virtually all of his poetry was lost because he wrote his poetry all the time. And I'm just going to put this on. Let's have a look at it. Again, I, I know I'm putting this on fast. 
and so on. But look at the amount of poetry. These are just random things that I, I got in the diary. Um, wrote two pieces of poetry last week, one for Grant's Potato Pickers and the other for Mrs. Robinson's place. I already mentioned that. On Boyd Wells Sorley, something of disagreeable weather, written a poetical letter to David McWilliams, Rock Seven, which is the ancestor of all the Williams in Rock Seven. Here's one. It's like, it's like, it's like Robert Burns. Mice made their nests in mattresses. So the mice wonder. It's very cold in the pool there. Composed a piece of poetry on the sofa and in addition to Robinson's Hall. Here is the, the next entry now. I'm taking a rabbit home. That's what we need to eat, of course. And a piece of poetry to my children of a religious nature. Just in the way a very religious man. And there is a striking, striking picture of James Aaron Fitzgerald. I uh, could just imagine this. If you could imagine being out in the middle of one of those rivers, in the middle of winter, in February, and walking across the, one of the rivers near Corfu, and you note know, in these diaries that here, I said my prayers on the ice uh, near the Greek form. Can you imagine a man kneeling down on the ice in the middle of the winter to say his prayers? This is, this, is, this is the sort of man he was. Uh, anyways, he was interested in very, very broad things. I don't know whether I should mention that now or not. I think what I will do, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, James. There's a sort of a, li a literary controversy about it. And, I, and this is what, what I think I better do right now before I run out of tea. Uh, this sort of started almost as soon as this famous song, wonderful, was probably the greatest political, certainly the greatest political folk song that was ever written on this island. And, and, and I don't know anything about it in Canada. I will sing it for the later. It's called Prince Edward Isle of Duke. And there's an argument over the uh, and that start that was going on years ago, but it really sort of got going a little bit when Professor Edward I, Sandy I, came to the island in 1957. He wrote a book on Larry and in that book he said, "Look, this this song people attribute this to Larry Norman, and I kind of think it might be him." That's what he said. Uh, well, that was fine. Five years or six years later, the fact arrived, and he's a wonderful man, a wonderful man. I met him when I was 12 years old, and he's a great inspiration. He's, he's done more work on Irish folk songs than any other people personally. He, he did do his work. But six or seven years later, he wrote another book. And this time, the book was about Lawrence Doyle from St. Peter's. He collected the songs of Lawrence Doyle in St. Peter's, and he collected Lawrence in the West. And he got the same story. Lawrence Doyle wrote this song. Well, there was a third candidate, because some of the older people who knew the songs in my part of the country uh, said, no, no. That song was written by a third team teacher here, and they never told him the first name. They just said, Good Joe. Good Joe. Well, if you start looking at the, the work of, of, by the way, he came down pretty solid on the side of the door. And I think if you were taking the two candidates, Gorman and Dorman, Gorman still has the strongest, uh, strongest case. Neither one of them are strong enough, and neither one of them is as strong as Fitzgerald, not even close. Uh, he said, now, to take you on first, Lawrence Doyle is a wonderful songmaker, a very gentle man, very gentle man, uh, not bitter in any way. Wrote the, the, one of the greatest island folk songs is when Johnny went about on the stairs and he wrote the Heather Flowers, the single flower. One is absolutely wonderful. Uh, but the problem with Doyle, the problem with Doyle is that he is a 
the number of people who won't get right to something. There was no bitterness, there was no anger, there was no, and not only that, it had no broad political vision, which this song has. It speaks of a broad, very broad issues. Uh, the, the other thing is, is the body of mediocre work, really by the world work that is in 1865. This song was written in 1873, and it's very mature in terms of work. It's not the work. Doyle was only in his mid-20s. So was Lawrence in 1873. It's just not the work of a young man. It's the work of, of a mature man who had actually seen. And I'll, I'll show it to you, and I probably should have it on here. You, you won't be able to read it. Uh, because it's too, the, the print is too small. Uh, but, uh, anyways, uh, getting to find the lyrics. Uh, it, 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 it'll be just too small for you. But, um, the, the song itself is a very large issue. What's that? And I. I I was going to make this point later. If there are three main issues, three main issues, and those of you who are regular, who uh, know your history, you'll pick up on this. It's about problems over the land, as in land ownership, and the terrible problems that the tenants were having to decide. That's the first issue. The second is the line about independence. And the third is about forced immigration. That's what that song is about. Now, think about it, folks. What country, all through the 1750s, 1600s, 1800s, was totally preoccupied with independence, with tenants? forced immigration. What, what country am I thinking about besides the uh, you know, And Fitzgerald went through this twice. He went through it twice. He, he was born in 1797. He saw everything. He saw the whole works. And he came over to the island and he saw the same thing. Because that's what was happening here. Now, uh, and he had had I'm absolutely convinced now that I've lost my train of thought, but he had had um, troubles with the landowners. Um, trying to think now. Uh, he had his own children. Getting back, back to what I was saying about uh, Lawrence Doyle and Larry Gorman. Larry Gorman, again, did, when you make the argument for Gorman, There was something that he wrote. There was some, somehow like this. And he never, ever wrote Assassinated people. You know that. I mean, you know, I'm pretty sure you demonstrated in some. I don't know how. Uh, maybe I will. I'll just give you a little dash of the sort of thing that, that Larry Gorman would write. Uh, well, when he came to Los Angeles in 1876. The, the, the song. This, this is the sort of thing that you say. I don't quote this in my seven at all. My sad misfortune went on that fateful day. I found instead of human beings, they're more like beasts of prey. <laughs> they kick you in the back like you, and they give you lots of jaw, they kill you, skin and eat you, and welcome for the law. <laughs> That's the sort of thing, you know? <laughs>
that for the only person that ever uh, knew it was, was, was my mother, and she sang it for me, and uh, somebody told me that one of those, uh, those uh, folk groups had recorded it, I don't know. But um, anyways, Corbin never wrote anything about Prince Edward Island. Prince Edward Island is, 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 is dealing with very large issues. And I think I'm going to, uh, I'll give you an example of the sort of things that, that uh, Fitzgerald uh, was concerned about. Uh, now, this is a, 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 he's writing his diary. He's talking about a speech, uh, 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 yes, a lecture he gave. Now, this is in 1857. You know, you think nothing happened in the countryside. Every one of going to these little, these little gatherings and the debates and the lectures, my heavenly days. Uh, they, and they were heading into the schoolhouses and there was an incredible, uh, an incredible uh, drive for self-improvement and people would go. There was one that I was telling you about in my, in my school in the 1860s. No, that was, yeah, it was the late 1860s and there was a man, a lecturer came and he, all of these people and they wanted to hear this because all the ones vote against it. Because they hate the value of the generation. Anyway, they go to the they go to the lecture and it was reported the next day that they were not very happy because this man wasn't a politician, he wasn't on the confederation at all. He was some kind of early form of psychologist. And his lecture was in the mind, you think of two things at the one time. <laughs> <laughs> they were not pleased with this at all. Anyways, <laughs> home they went, sadder and wiser. But this is Fitzgerald, because he was asked to give a lecture at the Four Hill Schoolhouse on Wednesday night, the 29th of April, 1857, with the state of education, morality, and religion. In the United States, Scotland, and Prince of Rome. Notice that he left out Ireland, because Ireland was off back as much at the top anyway. <laughs> and with him. And, and so he leaves it out. And then he said, I prove that Prince Edward Island ranked higher in education, morality, and religion than either of the three. So <laughs> the PDI was, was second after Ireland, let me tell you. Yeah, and uh, I likewise gave an eloquent discourse on poetry and on pride and the awful death which lately happened through fire, fever, and drowning. Two hundred people. Two hundred people there. And he had a tea at Mr. Yo's and a glass of punch. So, now that was something, because he hated Yo. He accused Yo of cheating him on... Yo was an agent, and he hated dealing with the land agents to begin with. He was a poor man. He had no money. It was a constant struggle. Anyway. Uh, so... Uh, what was he in interested in? That's the sort of, he, he spoke about very, very broad issues. Now, here is, I'm getting to the, the point. The, this song, uh, was he interested in, in this song? This song is, the, as I say, the land issue. And you look at this. This is an entry from his diary in which he says, at St. Elmer's, the 12th of August, a commissioner's court for buying the land. Uh, at St. Elmer's, Friday the 14th, at the court of commissioners, uh, hope the result will, will be good, will, will, hope will be good and the land will be sold. What is happening in 1860 was a huge uh, investigation. And they were talking to tenants. They were talking to tenants saying, what, you know, what kind of situation are you in? And the tenants were giving their uh, their their, uh, their their sad story, and some of them were terribly sad. And Fitzgerald seems to have testified at that. He became involved. You would look for a thousand years, and you would never find, for instance, Larry Gorman interested in something like this. You know what I mean? Larry Gorman was a known public man, and, and all the time he was writing letters for people, and he was writing petitions for making the roads better, and he was doing all these things. Um, then we're into, then we're into the 1864. 
And again, pre-federality is talks about and is very much against confederation. And Fitzgerald is head over heels uh, against it. Uh, a great agitation about the union of the colonies, 65. Wrote two letters to John McNeil and two to Hughes, the examiner of about the union of the colonies. Uh, wrote to McNeil on the union the 32 or 33 verses of poetry. Now, British poetry and both anti-confederation. Exactly like this song. But it's not this song. I'm just doing this to show you that, that, that Fitzgerald was involved in these things. And you're going to say to me, well, you know, is there any proof? And I'm going to have to say, this is all circumstantial. And I'll tell you why. He was a great man to correspond with the He And he notes in his diary, uh, every time he sent a letter in, and what it was about, and he was writing in about letters against Confederation. And he wrote, and he wrote them to the wrong facing the of the letter. The examiner did not print letters that he wrote uh, because he notes sending the letter in to the examiner, but I looked at the examiner who issued at the time, and, and they were not there, so they weren't printed. Now, there was one paper that did print, because it was a pentagon in the that were then had against the And they were still against the Indian Federation. Well, I am sure that the chair wrote this song in the summer of 1873, maybe 74, but uh, uh, the weakest part of Ives is weak. Uh, like I say, uh, he's a giant, because I mean, he, he, the influence that I had to become a folklorist. But he, his argument is, uh, he said that the song was written for people. People didn't write folk songs. They wrote them at the time the thing happened. You didn't wait seven years to tell strong about uh, anything. If there was a hanging in Charlottetown, you wrote the song that day. That's the most valuable, you know. It, 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 that song was not written this way, I'm sure it was. Anyway, Danny and I have this friendly disagreement. But where was I? Uh, the problem, this is the problem. The summary line journey is this. It broke my heart, I tell you, because I was going to, I was sure I was going to find a copy. Uh, I was going to find a reference to the song. Directly, there, I told you it was him. I never got an answer. It's gone. And there was another letter. He wrote a letter to the Herald, Charles Herald. Uh, he was the point that I'm, I'm making, and I know that I'm trying to keep you over the head this, but the point I'm making is he was involved, passionately involved in the fight against Confederation, in the fight to solve the land question. And, and he was such an emotional man. He had lost, lost in the sense that the boy had gone away. Uh, his boy, David. Uh, had been left home under a cloud. He said in his diary that they had just had had nothing. But I suspect it was just like him. And there was, it was a big blow up, and David had been left home. And he grieved. It, it bothered him so bad. And he, David went, he worked in his room. He worked on the railroad. And uh, three or four years later, David got married, and in his diary, there's a poem which he, 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 he wrote to his son when he got married, saying, you know, bring the world home and I will embrace you both. It's a great poem. It's a great poem. I just took it over here. 
that was the biggest thing was so lonesome for this, this boy. He's still sort of grieving that, that, uh, uh, that, that, that the boy had gone away. Uh, anyways, uh, more stuff, just more stuff. I'll, I'll get through this pretty quickly. Uh, oh, here's one. You mentioned got a piece of poetry in the Examiner about the Union of the Colonies. Can't find it because I think they threw it away. And a high syllogism on the Wellington Hibernian Debating Society. This is the Hibernian. This he would be involved in this as he would be forming this. Um, and then, of course, like all good school teachers, he was talking about it in school. Well, the reason why I say he wrote the song is because, for two or three reasons. Number one, because it was the sort of thing he was writing poetry about, and because the tradition had to write the song, and because he was interested in all the issues. And you cannot say that for either of the other issues. You just can't. Gorman and Doyle, uh, as I say, Doyle was a very gentle man. Gorman was just a personal assassin uh, in a lot of ways. Um, anyway, um, the, and this is the one reference that I've got to him. I will read this to you. This is straight in the newspaper, and it's going to be hard for you to see. But if you would see this, if you could see this, it's a, it's a meeting at Lot 13, and it's a meeting about Confederation, and it's in 1870. He would be 73 years old at this point, and he was still going to try. And it says there, amongst other things, Mr. G. H. Fitzgerald is a fan of Confederate writing, a Confederate writing, and he's vexed that this meeting unanimously decided that he didn't want any part of this, okay? Uh, Mr. J. H. Fitzgerald gave a long-winded speech, because he would make a long-winded speech about that, uh, of Polar's Confederation. In the course of his remarks, he made an attempt to contrast the Irish Union with the Colonial Union, in which he failed to show the audience any similarity existing between them. Now, that would be the exact thing that he would be doing, because, as I said, he, he was a very broad spirit, and he was interested in large social issues on life the, 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 the other folks on neighbor. He, he was a spokesman for his community. And, uh, and this last thing that I will show you, um, which is something out of the Summerside Journal when it finally appears after 1873, Just a few lines, and I had to do some digging for these things, I'll tell you. This is a trip that was made by, I guess, the, one of the writers for the Summerside Journal in 1873, when Fitzgerald was an old man, uh, a sick man, and, and was no longer able to sort of take part in, and, uh, in, in, in things the way he had. And they talk about coming up to Wellington and getting to the Wellington Inn, which is at uh, Day's Corner, I guess. This is a model island inn and has not suffered by the exchange of proprietors, although one thinks of the old familiar faces that made Sandy Allens in the past a very haven of rest to a weary traveler. The drive from Goodwins, which is up along there, for many miles is void of interest. You don't even come across a decent piece of corduroy for a long time, the road being tolerably good with only an occasional quagmire here and there. This, by the way, 
for that. It's kind of a little uh, uh, jive because they call it Wellington Center. Quite and uh, yeah, here and there to remind uh, because because it's a third one, you know, the bush one or something. To remind the wayfarer of who is the most beautiful primitive settlers who first christened the locality. Here, by the way, we pass Mount Hemlock, which is what Fitzgerald named the community he lived in. As I say, he named every place that he uh, that he, he, he went to the rural retreat of the venerable Cole Fitzgerald. Now he was known at that point. Larry Warren was known. Larry Warren was not known. Most. They were they were true folk poets, there's no question about that. He was a little bit more than that because he was a literary man, which, which they never had a chance to. But he was, he was widely known. The venerable poet Fitzgerald, for a long time, a teacher of knowledge and a cultivator of the brain, as he poetically described himself many years ago, peace to his ashes he did. Now, they know, I think, that he's not, but anybody <laughs> 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 But if he's not, may he pour forth some of his music, musical strain. He did this. This is a song. This is a song we're talking about. And he talked about writing songs. He was a poet, but he's also a maker of songs. And that's what this is. Now we'll tell the thing for you in a minute. Um, he's to his ashes, if he's dead. But if he's not, he may pour forth some of the musical strain in the ears of our superintendent of public works, an end. That's an Irish term, I think, and I didn't uh, about it. The corduroy we spoke of. And then they end up by saying, We don't wish the superintendent of public works or any other delinquent any greater punishment. <laughs> <laughs> because the wrath of Fitzgerald, you see, of those these things they didn't want to do any good. So that that is as close as I came. Uh, but he, he was well established and, and the work as I say, he had lived through what he was written about, which I will sing for you in a minute. Uh, he died. I want to give you some. I've been talking for a long time. Uh, I, I, I don't want to give you much. He died in 1870. I had his will. Uh, gosh, I brought him and had it with me. I just left it in the car. They oddly pictured Carol being. He, he put it, he wrote, I think, in the song. But anyway, <coughs> it is, I know that he left uh, his uh, sons. He had two places, but he was a great farmer. He was a very good farmer. Uh, he, he was a great man for promoting other <coughs> things. I want to show you. I've lost all my stuff, of course. I, I do this all the time. It's just that he did. Uh, I want to show you a little a poem he wrote. And a poem he wrote about the Wilmington Blacks, <coughs> in which he talked about the island. Uh, well, we're doomed. <laughs> I can't find it. Uh, I know about this is going to happen. Um, here, here. Oh, hi, God. My students do seem to laugh at me when I do things like this. So, feel free. <laughs> it's not here. This song is Spanish. And you have no Great. This. And the, the other thing that you get in Prince Edward Island is, is his great love for the island. And, and, and this is one of his. His poems, and I've left it in the middle of it, but it's quite long. He was arguing for the public of blacks. Yeah. He said, I grew up in a black growing area in Ireland. I didn't know that. I didn't know whether they grew blacks in, uh, in, Cork, uh, in Cork County or not. But that's what he said. And he said, I'll just read you a little bit. In this gem of the ocean, Isle of the West, where maidens are pretty and men stand the best. People are willing, as far as I know, to use their endeavors to let the flax grow. Ye fair country maidens of true Caucasian race, who love friends and lovers in your native place, I wish to impress this on every man 
Next spring, sow as much black seed as you can. Our season is short, but my labor and care are nothing to sown in time to prepare. As for my humble self, I'll do all I can to make the black grow the better of man. The big argument is this, it's clear with this. It's have to become independent. You have to put and make the island independent. Don't be dependent on stuff coming in when you can grow it. Uh, you can create a, 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 a crop industry here. Anyways, uh, yes, in his will, he, he left uh, the place of the boys, and he left that. Uh, there were four boys and four girls, and he, he left, uh, I know he left two sheep uh, to one of the girls. And the priest who, who had a terrible time with him because he was he was just irascible. He was he, he was just hard to deal with all the time. And, but in the end, he did all right. He left the house. He made his amends, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure Father McDonald or whoever it was uh, must have been sort of taking it and saying, "Well, we came through in the end." But he was. He was, uh, he was a scourge almost to everyone with his opinions. Um, well, I, as I say, I could talk an awful lot longer, but it's Friday night, and I'm not going to. I'm going to sing you Prince Edward out of you. George, how are we doing for time? Uh, I, I, I'm going to go to bed. It's going to be 85. Oh, shit. It's 85? Oh, oh, it's one thing. Oh, hell, well, where was I? I think it's a lot of time. Uh, now, I've got to find the words for Prince Edward Isle of Because I can sing about 10 of these verses, but I don't think I can sing 15 of them. Uh, uh, no, George, I think I'll just, uh, it's not too bad, I'll do the best I can here. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know something I suspect, all right? I just suspect that, uh, like I say, that this was in one of the newspapers, and I suspect the Journal of Pioneer. And I think people had copies of this. And I think that's how that song spread so widely, because my good friend, Tommy Banks, who needs to call the town here, knew it. He knew it, and he knew every word of it, and he sang it. And it was known right throughout the island. And, uh, I think people, as I say, learned it in, at times off, off copies, uh, and probably handwritten copies out, out of, off the newspaper clipping or something. Anyway, I was telling George that the tune of this song, uh, I think it's to the tune or a, a variation of the tune of Sansol Hill, which is an Irish, an Irish immigrant song, <clears throat> and I may stop and comment in the middle of it. Come all you hardy sons of toil, pray lend an ear to me. While I relate the dismal fate of this country, I will not pause to name the past. For comrades grieve when they must leave and bid the child of you. The first thing is the grieving over the leaf. Again, it's so much an Irish theme to begin with. The the leaving of the homeland. And and uh, he as I say, he got a double dose of it. Uh, <clears throat> because of the Irish situation, and then coming here and seeing the same thing happening in the 18, late 60s, and all through the 70s and 80s, and the place is draining, especially with the young people. Good job everybody was having 15 kids, because uh, they managed to, you know, have it, you know, it still looked pretty good, even by the 1880s, but uh, the young people don't. There is a band in this land who live on top and well, their stores they rob the poor, and there's no wings they ride. With dishes fine, their tables shine, they live in princely style. These are the maids who made us slaves, 
and sold Prince Edward Isle, sold the island the, the Confederates. And this is what he had been writing about and talking about. The father's boy, his only joy, must bid a sad farewell. They're parting here no more to meet, for who on earth can tell? Far from this island, prairies wild, and is new. Content they stay, and bless the day they did this isle adieu. Our daughters fair in deep despair must leave their native land. To foreign shores that quickly born, as I do understand, the tide it flows, they all must go, I'll tell else to do. And parents grieve when they must leave and bid the child anew. The reason why so many fly and leave their island home, because it's clear they can't stay here for work to do their none. In other climes, there's better times. They can't be worse, it's true. So we or woe, away they go. Prince Edward, I with you. In days of yore, from Ireland's shore, our fathers crossed the main. Through dark and drear, they settled here to quit the tyrant's chain. With hearts so stout, they put to rout the forest far and wide. Rough logs they cut to build their huts upon Prince Edward's Isle. The place was new. The roads were few, the people lived content. The landlord came, the fields to blame, each settler must pay rent. So now you see the tyranny which drove us to exile. Begin again across the main upon Prince Edward's Isle and see what he seems to be saying is you saw what happened in Ireland. You saw us having to leave, the, the tyranny he called it. And we had to leave and now the landlords are are are, clean, are are making it miserable for us and are driving us. And you know he was in constant, constant um, trouble with the landlord. So was so were all the farmers. There were many, many of the tenant farmers at that point. Um, and then he, he goes on from the, the whole land issue to the terrible tragedy, he thinks, of confederation. But changes great have come of late and brought such curious things. Dominion men have brought us in the aisle with railways ring. There's maps and charts and towns apart and tramps of every style. There's doctors mute and lawyers cute upon Prince Edward's Isle. There's judges too who find a clue to all the merchants' bills. There's school trustees who want no fees for using all their skills. There's love for hogs, for sheep, for dogs that this way do not smile. For changes great have come a place upon Prince Edward's Isle. Now, he makes the last, the last sort of dash for independence. He says, you know, we'd be better off with free trade. This is the sort of thing that he was, 
he was, he was always thinking about, as I say, a very, very broad thinker, which is what this song is. And this is what he was writing about. Uh, don't hear success to all the rest. The question of free trade. Join hand in hand because it's grand. They're plainly in the shade. The mainland throughout the world throughout. Take courage now, send true. My verse is run, my song is done. Prince Edward, I'll let you. Well, that's Prince Edward, I'll let you. Anyways, uh, if there are any questions, I'd, I'd, I'd gladly uh, answer them. I, uh, to the best of my ability. <laughs> yes. Um, you have a profile on Prince Edward Island. Did he have a big book or obituary in any of the papers when he died? You know, I, I would not be able to find the picture of him when he died. Uh, I know that he's buried at Grand River. In the 1970s, when all the churches, all the strikes, uh, decided that they were going to you know, fix things up. And what I think what they did was they took all the gravestones, because they were, you know, in the little graveyards, and they were all kind of in perfect lines. And so they threw them all to one side. They harrowed them out and, and smoothed it all up, stuck them back, and none of them, they're all in straight lines, and none of them are in the right place. <laughs> that, that's what they told me. But he is buried there, but I have not run across the I've never been able to find the obituary box. And you know what I want to say? See, once the Federation, everybody sort of had to jump on board. So it would probably be something that would not be mentioned. Because he was persona non grata with a good many of the newspapers who are already for the Federation. Uh, and they wouldn't print his letters. And as I say, the one paper that might have printed it was lost by heart. So, um, and, and, and so, but I think someday I'll find, I'll find references. I really do. I've been around for 25 years. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> seriously. Uh, well, you know, I was told to take care of when I was a child. And I never forgot him. And no, nor should we. Because, you know, I have to give you a fact he inspired me so his personal turmoil and his, his, his incredible, he had this incredible passion for things, which is the strength and the, the, the sustenance and sometimes the, 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 uh, the weakness of the young races. It, uh, you know, a passion one way or another. Uh, it sometimes got him into trouble, uh, but at least he felt strongly about things. And uh, he's a remarkable, remarkable character. And his, as I say, what surprised me, not that his memory lasted in the Richmond area, but that it lasted in the Hamilton area in Mont where he was in the evening before he died. You know, going back to that part of the world, they remembered him. The older people remembered about him and uh, uh, about him being the first school teacher. Yeah. Is there a question? No? Yeah. Well, he's a member of the, the chief party member of the legislature here on the phone. He was in agreement with Gordon about a whole lot of issues. Now, of course, he rattled everybody every day, but he had a rather rough. Uh, and, and he very likely was, he, I know that he was a supporter of this whole business of getting that land back. Uh, he. There is James uh, Durer at that time, who was with uh, Thomas Norman. Who was that for? He was a war member of the Chief Credit, and they won the, the majority of the legislature in the 70s. Okay. Uh, he, he 
was never a member of the house. He was never involved in politics. The one thing that really struck me about him, at one point, he was head of the temperance society in Pasadena. <laughs> <laughs> that is really <laughs> because he's always talking about, you know, bringing you two gallons of rum from St. Eleanor's, <laughs> or having three glasses of rum at Mr. Yo's, and I see, and he said, I don't know how I home yet. <laughs> well, my God, it's the, 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 the tortures that he went through, walking for miles to his squats when he was 65 years old, walking, and I'm serious, you know, he described how he was wet, you know, uh, walking home from school, because there were no roads, and he never stopped writing about the writing of the roads, uh, or about blacks, or about, and, and people died. John McDougall came and got me to write to his son in Texas, that sort of thing. You know, he was the letter writer of me, which the school teachers in those days often were. Some of you have seen me written letters to the Area and, and no 
I bet you that Mark Fitzgerald is in jail. I bet you he was. I wish. I talked to a man. Mark Fitzgerald is actually related to the Fitzgerald Kennedys. Oh, yes. John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Is that so? So if we go back to this, this girl, That's interesting. That's, that, that's that one interesting. time, uh, Edward Kennedy was speaking at the University of the I think. Yeah. And uh, Morris Fitzgerald had said to his face from him. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? That is very interesting. Well, first of all, I bet you any money that he needed more of his consent. And, and that's very interesting about the Fitzgeralds, because the Doyles did not have it. Came from Wexford, which I guess is where the, the Kennedys, some of the, the Kennedy family came from. And I swear that some of those young men looked, they, they really, really resembled the Kennedys. I always was struck by the, the, the resemblance of the, and they came from the same, from the same family. So, but that very interesting you know, uh, about him. And I talked to a man named Ben Crock. Yeah. And he told me, he told me, Whatever I know from that area, he told me, and I talked to him. Was it Edith? Mm-hmm. Also. And they're both wrong. Everybody would be telling me these things. It used to be, you know, uh, they would say, well, we would say, well, we have to ask some of the old people. I am the old people now. Right? <laughs> 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 don't ask me this. <laughs> and I don't know whether it feels too good about it. One last question. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. We're really pleased to have John here tonight. I tell you, he is not an easy guy to get, and I had I had to call down all the IOUs and all the Irish saints and everything else in order to get him here. But uh, it's really a pleasure to John. Uh, anytime we can get you down here and uh, we'd like to see more of you. Thanks, George. Thank you. <laughs> Quick mention about next week's lecture, uh, Michael Linkletter, another one of our own uh, island folks uh, who is teaching over St. Francis Xavier, will be speaking next week at our regular time, uh, 8 o'clock, on uh, ancient and modern Celts. So, uh, got a free evening next Friday. Do come along and hear that lecture. It promises to be very interesting. Uh, We're going to uh, call a conclusion to this evening's activities and make way. Any of you are interested in singing and dancing and carousing, there's going to be some music here in a short time, and you're uh, you're welcome to stay. If you're going to stay, though, pay the man at the door. Before you leave, though, we have some free sandwiches and cookies and so on, coffee and tea, so help yourself on the way out. Thank you very much.